Welcome back, folks. This is the next of our recorded lectures for ML200, and this is the Templars are behind everything. The Templars in history, conspiracy, and popular culture. So I thought it might be worthwhile to start off with a brief sketch of who the Templars actually are, just to establish a historical baseline, since some of you may not have that background. So they were created in Jerusalem after the First Crusade. Their original duty was to protect pilgrims. They were originally military monks or religious knights. Their first headquarters stood on the site, supposedly, of Solomon's temple, hence the Knights of the Temple, or the Templars. Now, in their early years, they lived essentially as monks. They practiced poverty, chastity, and obedience, and lived actually under the Augustinian rule. But there was a conflict here, because shedding blood was effectively their purpose for existing. And this is not a standard way to serve God in the 11th century. And initially, they're a very obscure order as well. What happens is that Bernard of Clairvaux, who was a famous churchman and the preacher of the Second Crusade, he's the head of the uh, Cistercian order, was very struck by them. And he thought that holy knighthood was a wonderful thing. And uh, this is in the tw early 12th century. He popularizes the Templars through his writings. He helps them bring about uh, the new Templar rule, something that is specifically written for them and how they operate. Now, as they are formally integrated into the church, that inherent conflict that I mentioned continued. Now, some older scholars will still talk about three orders of medieval society, those who work, those who fought, and those who pray. Uh, with the Templars, suddenly the two orders are being confused. There are whole differences in culture ingrained into the medieval world. A knight and a monk are going to approach the world in two different ways. So can there really be such a thing as Christian knighthood? Now, they were fairly well uh, respected by most of the church. Some still doubted them. And the kings of Europe uh, accepted them very enthusiastically. Uh, King Alfonso I of Aragon tried to bequeath a whole third of his kingdom to the Templars. Now, this meant that their statuses rose, status rose. They were given thousands of estates, um, the responsibility for transmitting money and supplies to the Holy Land. And uh, what happens is that they basically become bankers. Uh, they are actually responsible for sending what is the first European income tax, the crusading tax, uh, to the Holy Land. So they're, you know, high status people on great terms with royalty. And due to the decline of the Crusader states, they started to focus more of their attention on their European holdings. The problem, of course, is that their whole purpose for existence is to help protect the Crusader states. So the fact they were not doing that, the fact that they're involved in Eastern politics, the fact that they're so wealthy, started to make them an object of suspicion as time continues. So we're in the 13th century now when this is happening. Um, they're seen as overly proud, uh, prone to avarice. Um, they are mistrusted by feudal lords for taking part in money lending. Um, money lending is kind of a suspicious thing in medieval Europe. You are not supposed to charge interest on loans. So the only people who were actually lending money most of the time uh, were Jews who were not subject to that restriction as non-Christians. Uh, the Templars were accused as well of giving poor counsel and a bunch of the writers of the 13th century spread tales of how greedy and foolhardy and corrupt they were. Now, this kind of comes to a head uh, due to their involvement with the Ismailis. Uh, these are the uh, famous assassins. It's a, a very sort of fringe Islamic sect. And yeah, the Templars and the Ismailis are the inspiration for the Templars and the assassins of the Assassin's Creed series. Now, supposedly, the assassins pay them a yearly tribute, and they didn't want to lose this money. So when the assassin leader contemplated conversion to Christianity, they killed his ambassador. That was probably made up to dirty their reputation. They maybe did interfere with the diplomatic process somehow, though. Now, the Templar Grand Master, during the time leading up to the Battle of Hattin in 1187, this is the fall of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, uh, was particularly hated. This is Gerard de Riedfort. Uh, apparently he interfered with his succession to the kingdom and then was a terrible military leader and made very serious strategic errors. Uh, the relationship with the papacy also became 
very rocky over time. Uh, Innocent III, who was one of the great popes of the Middle Ages, issued a papal bull in 1207 uh, complaining about how the Templars raised funds by sending out uh, preachers who promised to break church interdicts um, if they would pay. Um, church interdicts are basically one of the ways the church had of forcing rulers to do as they were told. So they would lay an interdict on your county or your fief or your country, and this meant that no religious services could be performed. Now in 12, the 1260s, Pope Clement IV basically told the Grand Master of the time, stop goading me unless you want me to revoke your order's papal protection. He never followed up on that, but uh, it was getting pretty heated. Now the end of the traditional crusading period in the Middle East is uh, the fall of the city of Acre in 1291. The Templars actually fought very nobly there, but they were blamed for the loss of the city, uh, especially once the survivors returned to the West and started to settle down on their estates there. Now, it didn't uh, help that the nature of chivalry had changed. Um, it was more about the knight errant and the personal quest at this point, not specifically Christian in nature, certainly not bound to military Christian orders any longer. Now, what happens in France is sort of unique to France in a lot of ways. There were sort of a tre there was a trend of accusations of witchcraft amongst the French nobility in the early 14th century, and these were accusations that were levied specifically for political reasons, often, you know, to try and get money, the money of the accused. And there were connections made between witchcraft and heresy. So this is what happens uh, to the Templars at the hands of King Philip IV of France. Uh, this happens in 1307. He charges them with heresy and witchcraft. Uh, they are arrested en masse. This is over 500 Templars. Very few seem to have evaded capture. Uh, they were stripped of their papal protections and they were tortured for confessions. Now, the French government claimed that their actions were all about religious zeal. But very early on, you still have critics saying, no, it's about the Templar Bank. Let's, let's be honest here. The other thing that may have been motivating Philip is an attempt to sort of take all the Templars' power away from them and give it to the hospital or knights who were not as problematic as the Templars in a lot of ways. Now, the chart, <coughs> pardon me. Sorry about that guys, too much recording today, apparently. The charges were ridiculous, frankly. They were charged with denying Christ three times any time they received a new Templar into the order, that they would spit three times on the cross, that they carried out sexual relations with their Templar brothers, they would have to kiss the back and the navel of the brother who received them into the order, and they worshipped a brazen head they called Bahamut. If you want to know where these things came from, it's probably confessions under torture. So, you know, it's really kind of awful to think about that, you know, these men are being, you know, mutilated and they're trying to give their inquisitors something to make the pain stop. Now, individual Templars are condemned. The order itself is suppressed. The Pope was threatened with an accusation of heresy if he didn't go along with it. Now, many of the major officials are uh, burned at the stake, uh, many of the members as well. The uh, Grand Master and three of his closest confederates were meant to be just imprisoned for life, but uh, they stood up in front of the tribunal, said they were innocent, and so they were considered to be relapsed heretics and were burned as well. So where does the legend come from? Now, the debate over the guilt of the Templars and the motivations of the French king continued for centuries. They were sort of a political and religious object lesson, depending on what your perspective was. So an English perspective might say, oh, look, corrupt religious men overthrown by the king. That's good. Roman historians would say the pope was pressured by the French king to do this. That's bad. Um, surviving military orders might have said, okay, they didn't succeed in their purpose, so who cares what happened to them? Now, what we see in the 16th century is the beginning of a whole trend of um, interest in magic. So Henry Cornelius Agrippa uh, and his work De Occulta Philosophia 
uh, talks about demons and spirits and powers inherent in them. And he drags in the Templars as examples of witches and heretics. This book is very widely read and very influential. So the association of the Templars with magic sticks. Now add to that the French political theorist Jean Baudin, and he discusses the tendency of princes to treat minorities unjustly. And he cites the suppression of the Templars uh, alongside the Christian and Jewish persecutions as bad things that royalty did. So these two threads kind of collide, and presto, you have the Templars as an oppressed magic minority. Now, romanticism also becomes a factor over time, and the Templars are certainly a very dramatic group. You know, they're proud, they're spiritual, they're martial, they've been betrayed. Uh, there are ideas that pop up, shall we say, conspiracies, concepts that the Grand Masters of the Templars had secret spiritual illumination from the Essenes, or the people who uh, wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that they were preserved in the canons of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So Jacques de Molay, who was the last Grand Master, uh, supposedly just before his execution, sent a trusted knight to the crypt in Paris where the other Grand Masters were interred. It came back with a shroud, um, and it contained a coffer full of the secrets of the order, the crown of the kingdom of Jerusalem, the candlestick of the temple, and the four golden evangelists from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, supposedly there were two hollow columns in this crypt filled with treasure. And according to all of this legend, all of this treasure was carried safely to Scotland, and where they had this, you know, connection with Freemasonry, because Freemasons, Templars, Illuminati, Rosicrucians are all connected, right? Now, in Scotland is a famous chapel, Rosslyn Chapel, as seen in the Da Vinci Code, which is sometimes said to be linked to the Templars, but it wasn't built until 170 years after de Molay's death. Uh, the St. Clair's or the Sinclair family that built it actually testified against the Templars who were put on trial in Edinburgh. Uh, other possibilities for the destination of the treasure? Oak Island. Don't get me started on stupid Oak Island. <sighs> that damn show. Anyways, um, I hate pseudo-history. I'm sorry. There is a myth that the surviving Templars took revenge. Uh, Louis XVI, the last Capetian, who was killed in the French Revolution. Uh, this was a death that was supposedly masterminded by the Templars working through the Freemasons. And there's an account from 1796 that claims that someone stood up at his execution and shouted, Jacques de Molay has been avenged. So the nature of the curse is as follows. Uh, Molay supposedly said that both Philip and Clement would answer for the crimes within the year. Clement dies within the year. Philip dies within the year. Philip's sons die not long afterwards. And that's the end of the direct Capetian line, the beginning of the Bourbon family. Lots of coincidences there. Now, in 2002, the scholar Barbara Frail uh, discovered the sheen on parchment in the Vatican archives. And this revealed that Clement V had actually absolved the Templar leaders in 1308. And this was not known to have happened until 2002. And of course, you know, it has absolutely no consequences whatsoever for the Templar myth. It is far too well-rooted at this point. Now, looking at the further development of the myth. So in the Enlightenment, um, despite the fact that the era was supposed to be all about the rejection of superstition, about rational life and rejecting the institutions and beliefs of the church, you still had a great nostalgia for knighthood. Um, this is a way of uh, sort of fostering uh, collective identity for the nouveau riche. This leads to the development of new knightly orders and the revival of interest in old orders, including the Templars. So I mentioned that connection to Scotland. So we see Scottish orders of Templars emerge and they claim to have a connection to Robert the Bruce in the 14th century in the Battle of Bannockburn, uh, where the English attack <coughs> on Scotland was repelled. Now, the legend of the Templar involvement here takes multiple forms. Supposedly, they distinguish themselves in battle, and that's the thing that's consistent among all these versions. 
And supposedly after this battle in 1314, a new royal order of Scotland was created. Um, we don't have any actual proof of this. There are other orders that are mentioned too. The Order of Thistle, uh, the Order of Herodom. These are actually later orders that are kind of, their origins are projected backwards to the 14th century, which is very tricky. All right, you got to think about the appeal of this legend as a whole, though. You know, the Templars are reclaimed as heroes. Now, you also have the Lerminius Charter. This is uh, a charter of transmission uh, offered by uh, a fellow by the name of Lerminius, who calls a secret meeting of the survivors of the order in 1324, uh, saying that de Molay had named him as the successor. Now, this document does exist. It's a document in a cipher code. It's held by the Freemasons in London. And if it's decoded, it is written in Latin, but it's not written in ecclesiastical Latin. It's written in scholarly Latin that dates to about the 17th or 18th century. So it is a forgery. And it actually reemerged in the hands of the court doctor serving Napoleon in 1804. Uh, his name was Bernard Raymond Fabre Palaprat, which is a great name, honestly. Uh, he supposedly also had a copper box containing uh, Templar documents, uh, de Molay's sword, and his bones. And he kept finding things. For instance, uh, a Greek manuscript, the Leviticon, that described Templar beliefs as Gnostic and Johannite. And Johannites were a group of heretics who believed that Christ was not the Messiah, that John the Baptist was, and uh, he came with esoteric knowledge, and Jesus was just a pretender. Um, what's the connection to the Templars? Well, they supposedly had the head of John the Baptist as a relic. Now, to be fair, there are lots of heads that supposedly were of John the Baptist. But think about Bahamut, the brazen head. Okay, even in Germany, you have the Ordo Novi Templi. It was a pre-World War I German group who believed in a secret Aryan priesthood, possessing knowledge of magical runes from German and Scandinavian prehistory. These priests, of course, would later become the Knights Templar. Now, the founder of Ordo Novi Templi also developed Ariosophy, which, if I had to sum it up, I would describe as social Darwinist knighthood. Yes. I don't think that needs to be explored any further. Obviously, all of those ideas would later go on to play a role in the development of Nazi ideology. Just always Nazis. Always. Anyways, moving on. So, if you're looking for the Templar legacy in popular literature, there are certain key ingredients that are always there. Uh, de Molay is a hero. The Templars have secret knowledge. They crisscross the globe. There's usually a modern-day Templar geek, who is usually the villain. Popes are sneaky, sneaky people. Uh, there's heresy and Satanism involved. And most importantly, the Templars still exist, and they're behind everything. Now, one of the most famous uh, works that include the Templars is Maurice Drouin, uh, his series The Accursed Kings, which is based on the idea of de Molay's curse. It is more of a focus on the history of the, the family, the French royal family. But the first couple books do deal heavily with the Templars. Pierre Barbet, Baphomet's meteor. Baphomet is actually real, and he's a stranded extraterrestrial. He gives the Templars scientific expertise in atomic weapons. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the realm of reality. Jan Goyuz, uh, the Crusades trilogy. Uh, this is uh, where Arne Magnuson is condemned uh, to serve as a Templar for a youthful crime. And he goes to the Holy Land and joins the Order. But he's won over by Muslim culture and advocates multiculturalism. Even saves Saladin's life at one point. And in this case, the Templars are described as noble and well-trained. And they're not the ones who failed, it's the King of Jerusalem who failed. And this gets turned into a movie series focusing on the character of Arne. Julia Navarro is the Brotherhood of the Holy Shroud. Templars are a secret brotherhood protecting the Shroud of Turin. Raymond Corey is the last Templar. Basically, this is, you know, FBI agent meets archaeologist going in search of the Templar secret. Uh, their secret, of course, is the writings of Jesus Christ himself. 
Steve Barry, the Templar Legacy. There's an evil Templar mastermind wanting to publish a secret gospel that reveals that Christ never came back physically from the dead. I should have said that another frequent ingredient of these uh, novels is that the church is bad and must be undermined somehow. And do I really need to talk about the damn Da Vinci Code? I'm going to tell you a story here, guys. I was in grad school while well, that damn novel was so popular, and anytime anyone found out what I studied, they would say, Oh, what do you think of the Da Vinci Code? And my response would always be, Oh, I try to think of it as little as possible, thanks. Because it really is that bad. So, you know, these are all, most of them are at least historically favored, flavored. Um, some of them are straight historical fiction. Others are conspiracy novels. You know, there are major hooks here, basically. All right, a little bit more, and then we'll close it out. So, of course, the Templars are not just appearing in novels. They are appearing in other media as well. So probably one of the most uh, famous depictions of the Templars are the Templars of Assassin's Creed. Uh, they, I've linked uh, an early story trailer um, sure showing you the original depiction of the Templars in Assassin's Creed. They're sort of the forces of order and control versus the forces of chaos, or at least freedom, as represented by the Assassins. So it's like the yin and the yang, right? They're usually the baddies. Uh, not always, however. There is one game in the series where the Assassins get a little bit above themselves, and this is Assassin's Creed Rogue. They start messing around with uh, Isu artifacts and uh, cause a major disaster. And the assassin who unintentionally does this is racked with guilt. And he turns coat and he joins the Templars in order to stop the assassins from getting their hands on these artifacts. So I've linked to the story trailer for Rogue there as well. And I was actually rather fond of Rogue. I haven't played all the games in the series, by the way, just some of them. But Rogue seemed to me to kind of balance the scales a little bit. I mean, yeah, you know, we don't want a shadowy cult or a cabal controlling everything that happens in the world. But, you know, what's the flip side of that? No order whatsoever? You know, freedom above all? Freedom above, uh, you know, protecting people? <laughs> you know, this, there has to be a balance. And this is something that... I think really added to the Assassin's Creed story that there does have to be a balance. This is certainly something that uh, is revisited in the more recent Assassin's Creed stories too. Uh, I've not finished playing through Valhalla. Obviously I neglected to take my PlayStation home with me when I was not expecting to get stuck in London for two months. Um, but uh, certainly Odyssey deals with the idea of there needing to be balance between the forces of order and the forces of chaos. Uh, another very well-known depiction of Templars is in a fantasy context in the Dragon Age series, where the Templars are basically the military arm of the Church of Andraste, uh, the Chantry, rather. And they are the ones who guard the mages, who are effectively prisoners because of their powers. It's This is a world where... Um, having magical powers opens you to um, demonic influence. Now, the Templars are not portrayed as very nice people for most of Dragon Age. You know, they are oppressors, they're jailers. Um, in Dragon Age 2, they're, they're actively abusive towards the mages in their custody. Uh, but they try to add a little balance to that with the third game, where you see that the Templars are actually, um, you know, they are given their abilities and kept in check using a drug made up of lyrium, which is the same magical substance that the mages use. And, you know, it's equally hard on them in a lot of ways. So there's a little bit more nuance added over time, just like what we see with Assassin's Creed. And uh, I'm just going to mention Nightfall as the one modern television take on the history of the Templars. It's not very good has some really good acting in it, but the storyline is decidedly ahistorical. And uh, I gave up a few episodes in. It's very beautifully shot, mind you, but uh, doesn't do anything particularly new or innovative. Uh, I, I do feel almost like 
the fantasy or the science fictional ad adaptations of the Templars are more interesting uh, because otherwise you're just revisiting the same old ground over and over again. So you were given one article to read for this topic, um, the article called uh, Baphomet Incorporated. Now, what you should be looking at when you look at this article is the importance of the pseudo-historical work Holy Blood, Holy Grail uh, to the Templar myth, because what it does is it creates pseudo-history or pseudo-scholarship that sort of uproots the Templars from their historical context into imaginary history. And you might look at the connections between uh, Templars and corporations in fiction as well. That's another interesting theme that he brings up. Okay, so that is the end of our recorded lectures for the week. I am looking forward to seeing you guys at our Zoom session. Uh, enjoy the last couple of days of reading week, folks.